Uh, for those that are new, the microphone that I said I need to turn on is just for the camera. There's no extra noise coming out of these speakers, so when I get loud, that's just me. That's not amplified. Uh, we learned that on like week one of me being here, that I don't need this thing to be amplified. Okay? Uh, but we're going to continue on in talking about salvation. How is it we have a relationship with God? Well, we have that relationship by grace. And when we say by grace, we need to recognize that our salvation is the source of that salvation is God himself. It's not yourself, it's God. He is the source of salvation that when you die, you may have a relationship with him in heaven. And how do you accept that grace? You accept that through your faith. One way I like to talk about this is thinking about a present that you have. That's grace. That's God's forgiveness for your sins. That's what God's grace is. That's Jesus' life and death and resurrection that we may have that relationship to, with him. That's grace. That's the free gift that God is extending to each and every person. All you have to do is accept it. How do you accept it? You accept it through your faith. Through putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about both of these themes here today a little bit. Uh, but before we do, everybody knows I love history. I, I love getting back into the ancient world and talking about things that happened in the far, far ancient past. And so I want to transport us all back to the year 1973. Whew! I can't hardly fathom going that far back. I know, some of you, you might be like, yeah, man, I don't even know what was going on in 73. I know, it's that long ago. And yes, I like picking on some of you, I know, okay? But let's go back to 1973. And why am I going back to 1973? Because I want us to go to the mass unit 4077. If you're lost so far, MASH is a TV show back in the 70s, and 73 was the season two, okay? See, there's times I don't uh, turn off my brain very well at night, and I have to watch something. I love watching MASH. Tammy can't stand it, but I love watching MASH, okay? So I want us to go clear back to season two of MASH. And if you don't know, MASH takes place in the Korean War, and it's a medical unit. They are not people there with guns out fighting people. They are there receiving the wounded and healing the wounded. So in season two, there's an episode of MASH where the MASH unit, the hospital, the MASH unit comes under fire by a sniper. And the whole episode is based off of this sniper firing at the MASH unit. And I mean, at one point, the doctors come out waving a white flag because they had wounded people in an ambulance and they wanted to get those wounded people into the hospital. They come out with a white flag and the snipers firing at them with their white flag out, the whole nine yards. And they get to the point where Colonel Blake, who's kind of in charge of things, he calls headquarters and says, we need you to come out and stop this sniper so we can, we can handle all the wounded. We, we're not equipped for this. And the headquarters says, well, we'll get there tomorrow, okay? So throughout the night, the sniper's shooting and people are hiding, all this stuff's going on. And they call in the morning, hey, I thought you said we was going to take care of this guy. And headquarters go, they'll be there sometime this afternoon. Okay, and so they go through this whole episode. I'm sure it was a scary situation if it wasn't a sitcom, Okay. You've ever been shot at? You know, it's probably not as funny as what the TV show makes it out to be. And so all this is going on, and finally, here comes a helicopter with a machine gunner, and they shoot down, and they take care of the sniper. And at the very end of the episode, you see where the sniper was, and this white flag come out waving, waving this white flag. And all these medical personnel and staff that have been shot at 
for hours on end, for 24 hours, whatever it is, are essentially saying, well, just let him die. Okay? But Hawkeye Pierce, who is the main character of the show, Hawkeye gets his medical bag and he walks out there to where that sniper was and the sniper's alive, he's lying there, can't move. And Hawkeye says, you have no idea how lucky you are that I'm doing a house call. Okay? Now, because I'm a preacher and I can't turn off my church brain sometimes, I was thinking about God and His grace. That we are enemies firing on God with our sins, saying, God, we don't want you. We want to rebel against you. We don't want anything to do with you and what you say. And yet he is that great physician who continually comes out to us saying, I'm here to make a house call. I'm here to make you better. I'm here to cure you of this thing called sin and this thing called death. I'm here to break the bonds between you and Satan. And as I watched that episode earlier this week, I just couldn't help but relate that to God's grace and our situation. Now in reality, the Korean, the enemy, who was shot, had a couple options. One, he didn't have to wave the white flag, did he? No, he didn't. But even when Hawkeye came out there, he didn't have to accept Hawkeye's help. He did, right? And that was him accepting that gift of that physician being out there to care for him. Well, we do that with God through our faith. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about grace, and then we are going to get into faith. And we're going to have two scripture readings today, and they're both from the book of Romans. So when you get to Romans, just stick there. But it's Romans chapter 6 is the first one. Romans chapter 6, and it's one verse. Now, if you're a longtime listener with us, I don't know if we have, do we have a blue? Okay, we got one. And now, if you're a longtime listener with us today, you've probably heard me talk about this verse in greater detail because I love using this verse when we talk about evangelism and how to evangelize and how to present the gospel to people. But it's one verse, if you're using the Blue Pew Bible, it's on page 799. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And I would encourage everyone to remember this if for no other reason than, than so that you can present the gospel to somebody else. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now we're not going to necessarily go through and talk about this gospel presentation. I have YouTube videos that I present the gospel. You can see how I do that using this verse. But I really, when we think about this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. What I want to talk about today is how do you relate to God? Now everybody in all of creation relates to God. Okay, I'm not talking to just church people here. Everybody relates to God because God is the creator of all things. And God is the ultimate judge of all things. So everybody, whether you want to believe in God or not, all people relate to God somehow. In this passage, Paul talks about wages or gift. Is that how you re relate to God? Do you relate to him as wages or as gift? Now, what do I mean by that? And I'll get to the other ones here in a moment. Wages, it's what you earn. It's what you get. If the life is fair, right? If we want a fair God, you want your wages. That's how you're relating to God. I want what I deserve. Or do you relate to him as gift? I don't deserve it, but he's still giving it to me. I'm excited about it. 
How do you relate to God? Another way we can talk about it is through law or grace. Through law. God has decrees he has made. And when you break those decrees, you earn your wages is what? It's death. The passage is clear. Okay? If you want to relate to God as wages, then that means you are under the law system, which means you have to live it perfectly. You cannot sin once. Once you sin, you're done. You have now earned death. Or would you rather relate to God as grace? I'm going to give you forgiveness of those sins. It's there for you. Now, another way to think about this is talking about the attributes of God. God is two things. and Well, he's a bunch of things, but these two things relate to wages and gift or law and grace. His holiness or his love. Holy is a fun word that essentially means to be separate from. Okay, when we talk about God, he is separate from the creation. He is the creator. When we talk about God, he is separate from sin because he is holy and righteous and and we are not. He cannot be around sin. If you want to relate to God based on his holiness and your holiness, you fall under the law, which means you earn death. But God has this other attribute called his love. And his holiness and his love cannot be compromised. He can't turn one off and embrace the other. And so because of his holiness, he also wants to have that relationship with his creation which comes out of his love. And out of his love, he says, I want my creation to be able to have a relationship with me. And and so out of his love, he says, you know, me, myself, God will take on a human body, a human nature in the incarnation, in Jesus the Christ. I will live that perfect life that is needed for the law, and I will die that death that is needed for the wages of mankind, that they may receive my love, that they may receive my grace, that they may receive the gift of eternal life. So how do you relate to God? Now, you might be saying, Scott, I don't know. You've made me think about a lot of things already. So I want to ask you two questions. And they are purely, purely, purely not supposed to be answered out loud. You can. Richard's a talker. He might do it. Don't do it, Richard. Just because I egg you on doesn't mean you should do it. Okay? And if you're new, just so you know, Richard's my batting boy. I hit him all the time with stuff, okay? That's just his role in our sermons. Uh, But I want to ask two questions. And maybe this will help you decide which way you relate to God. If you were to die at this very moment, would you be saved or lost? If you were to die at this very moment, would you be saved or lost? Now, you may have answered the question, but really we're going to get into uh, some thought processes you may or may not have used. I don't really care if you say saved or lost. I hope you said saved. If you said lost, I hope we can have a conversation about that. But really, it's the thought process to get to your answer is what we're going to be talking about. But now I got another question for you. Here's the second one. If God asked you when you died, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? If God asked you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Well, let's think about this in relation to salvation. 
What is your soteriology based on? Soteriology means theology of salvation. What is your sal how do you understand salvation? Is it anthrocentric or is it theocentric? Is it about you or is it about God? Where is your salvation based? Where is that theology based at? And you might be saying, Scott, what do you mean? Well, let's go back to question number one. What if you were to die at this very moment? Would you be saved or lost? Now, when I said that in your brain, was you going, I don't know. I don't know if I've done enough good deeds. I don't know if those deeds outweigh my bad deeds. I'm not sure. What's your answer? What's your thought process to get to that answer? Or was your answer, yes, I am saved by, by God's grace. When you think about salvation, is it about all that you do or is it about what God has done? That's the question. How do you relate to God? In a theocentric way or in a man way? Why should I let you into my heaven? Well, I was a pretty good person. Well, I helped Grandma cross the street over and over. On Mother's Day, I made sure my mother got some roses that would die in a week. Okay? Is that how you answer that question? Well, I went to church every single Sunday of my life. I didn't even take a vacation from church. I gave 10% each and every week. I served on the board as an elder or as a deacon or I sang in the choir. Is that your answer to this question? Or is it, I'm here because of Jesus? I don't deserve to be here, but by Christ, I'm with this guy. And that's how I am coming into heaven. It's not by me and what all I've done. It's about Christ and what he has done. How do you relate to God? What is your salvation theology based on? But now that I hope I've made pretty clear this idea of grace and how we should relate to God, we now have to move into the next portion of this, which is how to accept this gift that you have not earned, that God has given you. He has extended it to you. And if you're in Romans, we're going to go to chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're going to read the first 11 verses. Pew Bible, it's 798, the blue Bible. Therefore, the Apostle Paul says, therefore... Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Pause. I want to make sure we understand this. Part of this gift that is given is called justification. Part of the idea of this gift God has extended is justification that we may be found innocent in the sight of God because Christ takes on our sin and our wickedness and he gives us his innocence. So we have been justified. That's part of the gift, part of grace, that we may be found innocent of all of our sin. And how are we justified? The Apostle Paul tells us, through faith. And now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it that way. If you're not justified through your faith, you are at war with God. There is no peace there. The peace is found through faith in which God justifies. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, if I lost you. Verse 3. Now, or not only so, but we also 
rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He's talking about you, the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And so how are you reconciled to God? It's through Christ's blood, through your faith. Which gets me to wanting you to make sure you understand what faith means. And I have a lot more detailed instructions in other places, in other sermons I've done. But faith is essentially meaning you are trusting. You are putting your trust in something. And if we think about how our theology of salvation works. Are you putting your faith in man, in yourself, or are you putting it in Christ? Are you putting it in your works, or are you putting it in Christ's work? Are you putting it in your blood, sweat, and tears, or are you putting it in Christ's blood? Where is your faith? Now, some people say, Scott, I have a weak faith. I believe in Jesus, I believe he died for my sins, and then things go wrong in my faith, it just almost evaporates. Where is the assurance of salvation? My faith is weak. Scripture's also clear on this. It's through his faithfulness, not your faithfulness. It's through God's faithfulness that He has made a promise that if you put your faith in Christ, even that small little amount that you have that is flailing at times, His faithfulness to that promise is for your salvation. It's not about how good you are and how faithful you are because I promise even after you become a Christian, you're still going to sin. You're still going to fail. You're still going to not be completely faithful to God. Your salvation is based on His faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, right? We don't say, great is my faithfulness. That's not the song. Whose faithfulness? Great is thy faithfulness. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. It doesn't say, blessed assurance, because I know I'm good enough. It's because of Jesus is where your assurance is. Now, if you have any questions about grace or faith, I would love to talk to you more after service. I have no issues doing it. And next week, we're going to revisit faith a little bit more, and we're going to, revisit, and we're going to talk about baptism next week even. And so hopefully you come back for that. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God Almighty, we come to you now in praise and thanksgiving for all that you've given us. Most of all, we think about that grace you have extended, the forgiveness of sins. And we're so thankful for your faithfulness that you are holy and righteous and you are all-powerful that when you make a promise, it will come to pass. And we can cling to that for our own assurance of salvation. 
that if we put our faith in you, even though we are weak, you are strong. And you will hold firm to that promise that you've made. Lord God, let us search our hearts this week and see how we are trying to relate to you. Is it through our wages and our payday mentality? Is it for, or is it through gift and a present day? How is it we relate to you? Is it our own workings or is it yours? In Christ we pray. Amen.